Spanish listener. So just to get out there, even if you don't get it this time around, if you go ahead and try making it again, Hi, and welcome to the Archimedes stage. So up next we have Mark Townsley, and he's a Cisco fellow with over 25 years experience in the industry. He also teaches at Polytechnique, l'école Polytechnique in Paris, and he'll be talking about IP as the lifeblood of the internet and how the industry's moving to IPv6. So put your hands together for Mark Townsley. Thank you, everyone. Can you all hear me? Great. What are you looking at here? What is that a beautiful picture of? There's a, who's a student here? All right, students. You've taken basic, basic science class. So what am I looking at? An atom. Uh, the Bohr model or the Rutherford Bohr model or what have you. So this is an atom. Um, the atom clearly is the basic building block for all matter. It exists in a three-dimensional space, four-dimensional in time, that allows us to interact with one another. You know, some people think that there's you know, other dimensions that are, that are interacting with themselves uh, uh, such that we can't even see, you know, in-dimensional space, etc. But what we know is because of this atom, we can all interact with each other in the same time and space and build all these incredibly complex things that we build today. Now what am I looking at? Cells, plant cells. Same kind of thing here, right? From a cell, from an individual cell, I can put them together and, and divide, et cetera, et cetera, and create all of life. In fact, there's a recent article in Nature magazine talking about how there's an hourglass of simple genetic material that's replicated across all plant life that they're discovering. It's, it's ancient and really at the heart of all the complex plant life that we have today. And there's a similar thing in our own bodies, in the bodies of a vertebrae. Whether you're a, a chicken, a turtle, a mouse, a zebrafish, a, a frog, there's one point where you kind of all look the same. You're sharing something that allows you to build these incredible complex structures. So we see this again and again in nature. The internet has its own hourglass. And at the center of that, center of that hourglass is IP. This is why I choose to work on IP. I have a lot of flexibility in the work that I can do at Cisco. I've been in the industry a long time. I teach courses. I choose to work on IP because it is the center and is the lifeblood of the internet. Now, we're facing an interesting problem. We were given four billion of these at the birth, four billion unique addresses that point to these IP packets, IP destinations at the beginning of the internet. Less than three billion of them we can actually use in the global internet. And recently, in the past 30, uh, over the past 30 years we've been handing those out and very recently we ran out. So how does that look as, as, in terms of growth for the internet? We've been tapping into this resource, uh, fueling the growth of the internet. So these are the usable addresses I'm talking about. These were the addresses advertised in the global routing table, the number of addresses. So back in 2000, and this is the number of devices, we had maybe half a million devices on the internet back then. Half a billion, sorry. Half a billion devices. We had about a billion addresses in the global routing table as advertised as reachable of our three billion. And you can, you can map this over time. You can look at it. This is, this is publicly available data. Uh, this is a guess, the blue, because we're not really sure anymore how many devices are connected to the internet. But we can, we can make educated guesses. What's clear is at some point in the past 10, 15 years, there was a crossover where the ratio sort of changed. We were, before we were two to one, then we were one to one, and then we were one to two, 
and then maybe now we're one to five or, or, or one, to, one to three maybe, but how far can we go with this? How far can we go? In the past, whenever we needed an extra address to get from one part of the globe to another, we could just go get it and it was free. It was literally a gift to the world by the original inventors. But there's a point where there's no more gift. So we have to build new technologies, whole pile of them. And all of them have something in common. They're trying to take this four billion and get more. And they're stealing bits from other parts of the, of the stack. So when I say tags, what I mean is like a VLAN tag or an MPLS label or a tunnel or all these different things that basically coddle when you hear about network virtualization, sometimes we are virtualizing uh, various uh, uh, layer two functions that IP runs on top of, we're coddling these IPv4 addresses so that they go further, so that they can overlap, so that you can have the same address here and same address there. They don't have to be globally, globally unique anymore. And we're also building more and more NATs. And the NATs steal from the port space. So that's how we're extending this space, bit by bit by bit. Now what does that end up looking like? In the past, your home network, you had one global address, and of course you had this little router here that made all the devices in your home look like a single host, look like a single device on the internet. And there's a variety of reasons why the network evolved that way. It was never in the original design or in the original plan. It literally evolved to that. So that's what we had, one global address. But still here in the service provider network, we were able to run with simple routing. Of course, if you know, you probably know if you're, if you're a technologist that this NAT device here has to track all your TCP flows, all your UDP flows, all your connections. Right? This is something the service provider doesn't normally have to do in a broadband network. So what's happening with CGN, with, with the IPv4 exhaustion and the introduction of a carrier grade NAT, is now the private IPv4 moves into the service provider. Now what are the implications of that? Oh, okay, well I just build a box that can you know, share a couple of homes, no big deal. What it really looks like is this a huge box that's replicating the function, not just of a home of a home of a home, but of every TCP flow and UDP flow or what have you that is inside that little router at the edge of your home. Now, of course, we'll package that up and sell it to you for a lot of money or sell it to your service provider. But the, the point is, is that there's no aggregation happening. Normally, as packets move in an IP network from the edge to the core and back out to the edge again, there's aggregation. It's the heart of the scalability that we have in the internet today. And that aggregation allows us to scale up and build the internet that, that, that we have built over the past 30 years. These kinds of boxes, while possible to build, don't have the same kind of aggregation in them. So if you've got 10 devices at five or 10 devices at home, and they're all surfing the internet. Maybe you've got 500 different flows open at any given time. Across a million users, this thing has to keep up with 500 million flows. So it's a very different cost equation, and it puts the brakes on growth. Now, this is something that different parts of the world look at differently. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, from the content provider side, I was talking about the end, u the end user, right, the, the, the service provider. From the content provider side, you end up with a situation where one single IPv4 looks like a bunch of users. What are the security implications of that? IP addresses have reputations associated with them. If you've ever tried to use a sort of a hide your IP service and a tunneling service, and then tried to go out to certain websites afterwards and they say, sorry, we won't let you go here because that IP address has been used for spam before and we've blocked it. 
Now, when you have one global address at your home and it gets blocked for doing something bad, well, maybe it was your brother or sister. But if it's one IP address at the, at the internet service provider and you don't know if it's your neighbor or somebody across the street or across the country, you may be getting blocked just because somebody else at the same service provider did something bad. That changes the operational model of the internet significantly. And we're, we are facing that right here, right now, for the first time. There's another limitation. When you're routing packets, the normal way we pack, route IP packets, the scalable way, we're not looking at the TCP flows. We're not looking at the UDP flows. If you're building a big box that has to care, you know, watch 500 million of them, you're really not going to build it to serve, to, to watch 500 million of them for a million users. You're going to oversubscribe, right? The service provider is going to buy as small a box as possible to deliver the best average service to everyone else, and you're going to end up with this new vector in your service, right? It's not just about speed, but it's also about number of flows. And eventually, you hit a point between two hosts, no more room in the, in the CGN, no more connectivity. What does that look like? This was put together by a friend of mine in Japan. Um, he built a test lab, and he said, OK, I'm going to just put one PC and run one application and limit it to 30, uh, 30 flows, and then 20 flows, and then 15 flows, and then 10 flows. And by the time you get to five flows, there's nothing, nothing left. So you'll end up not just saying, oh, yeah, you know, uh, s stop doing that BitTorrent so that I can talk on the phone kind of stuff in your home. And that has to do with you know, bad queuing and things like that. You'll be like, you know, oh, you, you're, you're going over to too many websites. Why don't you shut your computer down so that I can use it? And it'll have nothing to do with the speed of the line. It has to do with state and memory. Just like before we had an internet, back in the circuit switch days, the, uh, you know, in the 70s, in the 60s, in the 50s, before that, we were building circuits through the network, stateful connections, based on the phone number you dialed. You were literally teaching the network, make this connection. And we got past that in the 70s and 80s and 90s with packet switching and IP. It was a revolution that allowed the internet to exist. This is going pendulum swinging back in the other direction. We're having to build that state up inside the network where we didn't have to before. And it's literally like going back in time. So I've heard, well, you know, I've got all the IPv4 addresses I need in my country. You hear that a lot in Europe. Um, you hear it maybe in the US as well. This is power throughout the world. Electricity, lights in, in the evening. It was, it was a composite photo put together by NASA. Uh, it's midnight. It, 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 any place you see a dot, they've, they've composite, you know, composed. You know, it, it, the world never looks like that because there's sunshine. It what we've composed here, what NASA's composed here is, is, is nighttime everywhere. But what it gives you, and also got rid of the cloudy days. It also gives you, a, a, you know, a nice view of clearly where electricity is, where power is, where money is in the world. Now here's our allocation of all the IPv4 addresses we have and will ever have. So if you're in the places where there's money and power, all right, good on you. What about Africa? Or my goodness, what about India? I mean, as comparison, they're kind of in trouble, right? All we can do now is sort of move them around, and that's that coddling I was talking about. We can buy and sell them, and there's, a tra there's an active trading market now where you buy or sell a single IPv4 global address, running price around 10 or 11 bucks right now. Probably will go up, who knows, right? So you can try to buy someone off somebody, you can build up your infrastructure underneath so that you can use IPv4 addresses without routing them the way we used to, but tunneling them all over the place to wherever your customers are. 
Uh, you can build in more centralized NATs. You can do all these things, but that's it. This is just moving the pieces around on the playing field at this point. So, we had a plan. Back in the 90s, we knew this was coming. Size of the internet goes up, free pool of IPv4 addresses goes down, and IPv6 deployment comes along. IPv6, you probably heard already, has 128 bits, which is like 340 trillion, 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 trillion. You could put five uh, addresses for every uh, grain of sand um, in, in the world or something like that. Um, this was the plan, and we're about here now, and that's the reality. Oops. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to give it a shot. Dual stack, put in your CGN, which I'm illustrating here as a fractional service. It's like, all right, this is your full spectrum of light. This guy's going to get yellow. This guy's going to get green. This guy's going to get blue. This guy's going to get red. And you all kind of look the same to the service provider. Make sure this guy doesn't do anything bad, or else you're going to get your service blocked too. Sorry. Right? Um, so here's your CGN, a stateful box, something that the service provider, a new thing that they have to put in and spend money on and operate. The idea here, the selling point is, what if I can get IPv6 routing to go at the same time and provide sort of a, a, a pressure release valve for this thing, right? And maybe he doesn't have to build as much, or at least he's got a way out. But to make that happen, I need uh, uh, an IPv6 internet. And even back as 2010, 2011, there, there really was no IPv6 enabled content at all. Um, now the business case for this is actually quite good. If, if we have that content, we can put together this whole study here. And it's using some, a technology I worked on called 6RD, uh, which allows an ISP to deliver native quality service, native IPv6 quality service to your home without changing out their uh, entire V4 infrastructure. So it's targeted mostly to broadband users. And it's been very successful. It's what um, uh, the l biggest IPv6 provider in France, the number two uh, uh, provider there, Free Telecom, delivers five or six million homes using this. Switzerland just uh, moved up to the top percentage deployment. So about 10% of all of traffic uh, in Switzerland that Google sees is IPv6 actually now. And that's all based on 6RD. Also, the largest provider in the US is based on 6RD. So 6RD helped get us up to a point where, coupled with the upcoming deployment of CGN, we've got a sort of a bypass. Now, native IPv6 does the exact same thing, and we're seeing more of that as well. Now, but I need this. I need lots of that to make this happen. So, how do we do that? What am I looking at? Anyone here from Russia? It's a European thing, isn't it? These are a bunch of crazy Russians. Um, for fun, they have this thing where they line up on a bridge, wait for a train to come, and all at the same time jump off. That's fun in Russia. <laughs> so there is a train coming on this bridge, and the train operator is honking, going, ah, I'm going to hit all these people, and then you just jump off. But of course, they're, they're tethered with bungee cords. So that's kind of what we, we did to ourselves. We got together, you know, Cisco, Akamai, Yahoo, Facebook, Google, enough of the content on the internet to say, all right, what if we turned it on all at the same time? Now, why would we want to do it at the same time? Not because we're crazy Russians. Anybody got an idea? Why would we turn it on at the same time? Sorry, webcast. Why would we turn it on at the same time? Any idea? 
That's part of it. So that other big companies will follow. That's a good, that's absolutely part of it. To turn them on at the same time so other companies will follow. But also, what if it doesn't work? So if it doesn't work, if Google turned it on by themselves, somebody goes out and searches on Google, well, damn, Google's broken. They search on Yahoo, right? And so this, this, uh, this is a problem for the, for the shareholders of Google because when you don't reach their ads, you don't you know, click and, you don't get, and Google doesn't get money. So by doing it together, if a user has a problem, and they try to go to Google, and Google's broken, and then they go to Yahoo, and Yahoo's broken, and then they go to Facebook, and Facebook's broken. Oh, wait a minute, something's wrong with my internet connection now. And they call their ISP. So it was to attract that call to the ISP that was delivering that V6 service. And this was a new idea, right? And we didn't know if it was gonna work at all. Uh, so we organized a 24-hour test flight. Now, why, why would it be so hard? Let's see. Um, in February of 2010, Google, well, in 2009, Google set up a site and they said, all right, we're going to measure all the people using, all those people using V6 out there. This is 0.25% of Google's users using IPv6. Tiny, almost not even measurable. That's a basically one or two million geeks out there turning on V6 for fun. Maybe some universities, research institutes. But what's even worse here is that red line is this thing called 6 to 4 in Teredo. It was built into Windows clients, into Macs, into some home routers to try to fake out and give you V6 without having V6. They thought they were doing a good thing, best intentions. And in fact, there was more of that 6 to 4 in Teredo out there than was native. This green line is the native IPv6. And 6RD is actually included in that. Well, it didn't exist yet, really. But the, the, the green line is the native stuff. So we had more of this fake v6 than we had native, real, operational v6. Now, why is that a problem? Take a look at the stats behind 6 to 4. This was a study done by Emil Ben in, uh, at RIPE. 15% of the time, 6 to 4 just doesn't work. It breaks for whatever reason. And there's a variety of reasons for another talk. So it just doesn't work. So if a website were to advertise reachability over IPv6, first of all, you get a tiny bit of users, and half of them are using a, uh, a technology that 15% of the time breaks. That's really bad. So we had to do some work before we could get to the point where we could even turn on uh, for one day. So here's another thing, dual stack behavior at that time. When I say it breaks, if it was something the user didn't see, th the content provider wouldn't care. But it's not. Back at this time, on all the Windows, all the Macs, everything, the V6 was already there. It was built in for a long time in the host. Most of the time, not getting enabled. But if you enabled V6, it tried to do V6 first in series with 30 second delays until it ever got to IPv4. So you could, it would, if you give V6 to a perfectly working V4 host and you try to go to a broken website, you may get four minutes of delay or something like that until it finally goes, oh, okay, V6 doesn't work, I'll do V4. So that's just simply the way the world was then. And it, it, in an operational sense, for, it, it can actually be a good thing because it's very deterministic. It causes, you know, on an enterprise network, it causes the user to call the IT department and say, this is broken. But from, a, uh, from, from the point of view of the, uh, uh, of the content operator, it's, it's a problem. So this is pretty much like, want to conduct a two-horse race? Start with one horse. If the other one dies, you send out another one. We came up with this little simple thing and called it happy eyeballs. Um, it, instead of one horse, then another horse, we send both horses out at the same time. Pretty simple, huh? So it looks like this. It lets the horses run in a race with each other. Now you get different types of implementations of this, unfortunately. Everybody seems to, each host stack wants to implement things differently. I really like what Chrome and Firefox did. 
because they instituted a 30 millisecond head start for V6. So you've got to be, V6 goes out the door, if you don't have a response yet, 30, 300, not 30, 300 milliseconds later, you get another, or roughly 300 milliseconds because there's a timer in there and it might fire before or after. But a few hundred milliseconds later, the other request goes out. Um, so only if your V6 is really bad, really high latency, will, or, or doesn't exist at all, will you fall back to V4. Um, so like that one, happy. Apple, less happy. Uh, Apple, it's all about the user, screw the network. Um, V4 and V6 go out at the same time. I'm going to go with the fastest one no matter what. Now, for, from a user's perspective, selfishly, from a user's perspective, maybe that's the right thing to do. I think it's not. That's why the guy kind of have the bemused guy here, partially because it's certainly not uh, uh, encouraging a move to V6, but also it causes the host and the applications to sit right on this non-deterministic border. Because if you go out and actually do measurements on the internet, you'll see that most of the time for native IPv6, the RTT, the latency, is about equivalent. Okay? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chart that Jeff Houston did that goes kind of like this, right? And it's like higher latency, lower latency. And most of the time, it's about the same between V4 and V6 if you look around globally. Okay? Now, any one user might have always sit on one side or the other side, but globally on large, it's about the same, which means a dry, a, a dead heat race is going to kind of sit like, oh, sometimes V4, sometimes V6, and kind of toggle back and forth and teeter on that edge, which operationally, troubleshooting, these kinds of things is annoying, right? So anyhow, I'm hoping that uh, Apple hears this and changes it. Because without a little tiny head start, we'll never get off running. Now, despite all that, one year later in 2011, this is that, uh, the red here is 6 to 4 now. The red, the 6 to 4 is trending down. Because we went out and, and got host vendors to change their policies on using 6 to 4, which was really good. Um, I, I, did, I wasn't sure we were going to be able to, to achieve that, but, but we were. It was great. Um, and native v6 is actually starting to pick up. So this was like free telecom and a couple of service providers out there. Um, February 2012, uh, the combination of disabling 6 to 4 and implementing happy eyeballs has taken that red line, which used to be, it's, this is 6 to 4 traffic now, they changed the colors. 6 to 4 traffic used to be more than native traffic, and it's really just killed it, dead. Uh, the blue line was the cumulative of the two, but now it's pretty much native only at this point. Now, if we move to now, this is uh, March 2013 here. Um, so what we see is there was 10 years of working on this before finally getting around to turning it on. Um, in 2009-2010, we started doing measurements, trying to fix things. 2011, we jump off the bridge together just for a day, and then a year later, turn it on and, and leave it on. And that was called the World IPv6 launch in 2012. And what that's done is cause native growth to just continue up. This purple line is a logistic exponential curve. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. And it's sort of just a curve fit of the actual data, which is in the green. So I took the same chart, the same data. This was back in March. Ran it again a couple of days ago. And we're still headed up the curve, which is very cool. The moment we start going like this, there's a problem. And we'll have to go in and see what it is. But so far, it looks like we might even be trending up off the purple there. So here's a logistic function. It's often used for technology adoption. You 
You know, at first it starts out like this, and then you have, you know, the, the really late adopters here. You never actually get to 100%, right? You get asymptotically close. So that's what kind of what we're, we're tracking right now. And if past performance yields future results with all those disclaimers associated with it, um, in about five years, we break a 50% point the point where there's more v6 out there than there is v4. And we're trying to do that in a way that it doesn't uh, bug you. <laughs> it doesn't bother the end user. And that's like changing out the wheels on a fast moving train without disturbing you know, as much as a, as a wine glass in the, in the coach, uh, the bar coach. If you want more statistics, shameless plug, this is a little uh, website that uh, I helped put together with some of my students, and we are looking at statistics. We rank countries. We look at it from a variety of different perspectives. If you want to take a look and see how this is moving along. So back to our uh, growth challenges uh, with V4 slide. So what we're trying to do with this V6 deployment and hitting that 50% point is basically get our fuel back. So we don't have to do all that other nasty stuff and rebuild telephone switches in our internet. We want to use routers, and we want to route IPv6. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to get up to 50 billion. These numbers, by the way, um, are the conservative numbers from CEOs of Intel, Ericsson, uh, Cisco, et cetera. Uh, outlining, you know, based on the number of chips they're producing, or the number of uh, the amount of network gear, or what have you, the the conservative numbers on where we're going to be. And where we want to go is looks something like this: 93 to 2003, 500 million IPv6 launch. We hit the era of the Internet of Things. Before that, it was mobility and BYOD. Before that, is fixed computing. So no offense to the early BYOD presentation, that's all very important, but the Internet of Things is next. And after that, when you put all of them together, you have the things talking to the things, and the standards in the Internet of Things amongst the sensor networks are v6 only, 802.15.4, Zigbee IP, all these kinds of things, they only work on v6. Now, then they gateway into v4 if they have to go to the internet if necessary. But they talk to themselves v6 only. So when you take the things and then you have the human network that we have today and put them together, that's where we get the internet of everything. And this is, you're going to hear Cisco talk a lot about the internet of everything. And how much money is at stake in the IOE economy? We put together these, these papers for the financial an analysts and say $14.4 trillion. That's what the industry is going after in terms of efficiencies, et cetera, over the next 10 years. And there's 21 business cases behind that. If you want to go look at them, feel free. Seems kind of crazy, but if you were in 1940 and you said plastic was going to be in everything, you might have looked crazy as well. So that's it. Internet of Things is coming. V6 transition underway. IPv6, Internet of Everything on top. Now I have another presentation that I don't have time for. It's called Routing IPv6 in the Home Net. And this talks about, OK, fine, Mark. You've got IPv6 to the edge, to the edge of the home. What's it look like in the home? Because there's a fundamental shift here. What we don't want to do is evolve the way we did in the past with IPv4 and put a NAT at the edge. We want to actually give addressing within the home. And this brings up some really powerful things. There's a working group in the IETF called HomeNet. I'm a co-chair of it. I encourage you to go read some of the documents. Our scope is IP plus or minus a layer, and we do the plumbing. Here we have a basic mantra to raise the bar in home networking so that your home network can actually be a network, auto-configured, arbitrarily connected, globally addressed. We've got work going on. Open source, how many open source coders here? Any? Good. Take a look at our GitHub, see what you think.
Uh, we did some tests. I'm going to give the presentation anyway. Um, we could talk through the evolution of an IPv4 home network. People say, oh, we only have one router in the home. What are you talking about? Actually, you might have more because we sold you one 10 years ago, then you bought another one, and you didn't want to throw it away, and then you had to buy your Apple time capsule, and then you had your corporate VPN, uh, and by the way, the electric, electric company wants to connect you to the internet. You have your sensors that may come along, and every time you run VMware or Parallels, you have a virtual router inside your host. So imagine no NAT, how do you make this work, right? I haven't even talked about home automation and stuff like that. But you could end up with lots of routers in your home. They look like routers, at least from an IETF, from a network guy's perspective, even if they're not a router from a, oh, I went and bought a router perspective. So this is how we're architecting this. And we're putting a routing protocol in your home, a zero configuration version of OSPF. You could pick another routing protocol if you want, but this is the one we're working on right now. Um, it allows multiple ISP connections, multiple v6 prefixes, and here's a very important point, multiple IPv6 addresses on one host. This is a necessity for end-to-end. -end. So your PC doesn't get one address, it gets three addresses if you have three different providers, like your ISP, your VPN, and your utility company, or what have you, or another backup ISP. So you get multiple addresses. The power behind that is now when you select a source address, you're also selecting an exit, and you're selecting a type of service. We did something called prefix coloring. This is with some of my students and uh, some service providers, where we can actually put a color on a prefix so that when your host has more than one prefix, if it knows what that color means, it can select it for a particular application so that it's routed in a certain way. We also did something really cool. Once you have a, a routed home network that knows how to do service discovery across multiple links and knows how to do routing, now I can connect multiple homes together. But of course, you don't want to connect everybody to everyone across your home. So what do you do? You only connect to your friends on Facebook or Google Plus in this particular case. So you, you put your home router and therefore your home network as an entity inside the social network, if they're circled to one another in a bi-directional fashion, boom, all of a sudden now you can get to the, your friend's iTunes library. You can look at their photos and you can print to their printer or their webcam or what have you without pushing the content to Facebook or to Google+. It's just the reachability that you're gaining through the social network. After that, the traffic goes over an encrypted tunnel. Really interesting stuff that you can start thinking about doing if you raise the bar for, of the plumbing, of the networking underneath. So don't let home in the title fool you. HomeNet is about more than just the home. We're actually uh, bringing auto configuration and multi-address and multi-homing and multi-prefix into the routing protocols. If you're a network engineer in an enterprise, campus, ISP, what have you, the technology there could be applicable to you as well. Here's what we're doing. And um, this is just one of the examples of what you can do with when you really have v6 embedded in your network. I've got a few other things. One's called Map, some data center stuff, really interesting stuff out there. Once we get to that, uh, as we approach that 50% point. So to sum up, CGN bypass for ISPs, raising the architect. That was the first thing I did. This was the business case stuff. It's so one of the main reasons uh, a residential ISP will deploy IPv6 today. HomeNet's raising the bar for networking because motivated by the fact that we've got v6 in there now. And this is happening in other areas of the network as well. And the third reason is to prepare. If you have a visionary, just look at the numbers to prepare for the Internet of Everything because the Internet of Things is v6 only, and we don't want it to be separate from the Internet of Humans. Questions? If I have time. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I'm just sort of interested in the 
the light of, shall we say, recent developments, namely last night around sort of privacy. And so I understand that, you know, network layer in some ways that's kind of exempt or, you know, it's almost lower than that. But I'm just thinking in terms of architecture and network architecture, what your thoughts are for, I suppose you can say, an increased privacy aware network. So that's a big question. Um, the in terms of v6 in terms of maybe the what the presentation that you just saw where i'm envisioning a world where there's global reachability to everything i still expect the network to be doing its part and that depends right um, to be doing its part in terms of security now the host needs to do its part as well right host security in many ways uh, is more secure uh, all the way up to application level security can be more secure than relying on the network alone, right? But the network can still play its part. And what I think is very important is for network devices to be able to automatically update their security parameters, if not their whole operating system because they have their own vulnerabilities. So one of the big problems we have today is the network equipment, especially the home equipment, has no way to update the software on it, right? That was a huge bonus for hosts when Windows and, and Macs, et cetera, could go do that security update, that increased the level of security in the host dramatically, right? It's these old, old Windows XP devices that are sitting out there with zero data tax still on them because they can't get updated. So the network devices absolutely have to have that feature in them. Um, so I think that's very, very important. Um, one of the nice things about not relying on NAT for security is that it lets you now apply the security where you want to, where you need to, not just at the NAT borders. So I think in V6 that's a, a, an opportunity if we think about it and don't just you know, try to think with IPv4 thinking. Uh, finally, IPv, all the uh, mobile devices that you have today use privacy addresses in them by default. What that does is, is it changes the lower 64 bits of the IPv6 address every day or every hour or what have you. Okay, so you'll, you'll go, if it's, if it's a temporary type connection, you can also have a fixed one if you want to receive incoming traffic. That's what you would publish in DNS. But you'll, you'll see that if you looked at your logs, you get a different v6 address from time to time on your mobile device. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the default behavior of a lot of these mobile devices, right? So we're looking at that, we're addressing it. It's, nothing's perfect, but uh, we're, we're on top of it. Any more questions? No? I used a lot of time. Thank you, Mark, for your compelling and informative talk. Mark Townsley, everyone. Thank you. And at 12, we have Nolan Bushnell at the O2 main stage. Thank you.